So it's, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the, uh, the first session then this morning and, and uh, the in personalized medicine. And uh, what we're looking at today are the translational programs, the t our TPOP programs, uh, translational programs in applied health, and as a runway into the Genome BC's personalized medicine program. And so and we're really fortunate today to have all three of our personalized medicine uh, programs uh, here represented. And the first is going to be, uh, we're going to have uh, the, the uh, wonderful tag team of Bruce McManus and Paul Keon uh, present this. And um, so you all have the bios, you all know um, our, our local stars here very well, so I'm not going to go through their bios. Um, but uh, I'll first uh, just welcome uh, Bruce McManus, and then uh, Paul's going to come up, and then uh, Bruce, I understand, is going to end the session. So please help me in just welcoming uh, Bruce McManus. Thanks very much, Brad. Uh, it's nice to be at the, the symposium this year again and, and uh, to, to learn. So, uh, Paul and I in the next uh, 20 minutes are going to try to give you a look in the window as to where we've come and where we're imminently going uh, with respect to the development of the diagnostic and predictive molecular signatures uh, in the blood uh, related, in this case, to heart and kidney allograft rejection. And uh, just to remind you, if you do not know, that uh, the Biomarkers and Transplantation Program is the adopted child of the uh, Center of Excellence for Commercialization and Research, the Center of Excellence for Prevention of Organ Failure, and Genome Canada funding in 2004 uh, really set us up for the TPA program and potentially for the PPM program. And this, this program was developed uh, focused on uh, acute and chronic rejection uh, biosignatures for uh, heart and kidney allograft rejection, but it's evolved into a, a broader uh, program uh, upstream related to the life cycle of risk through presence, progression, response to therapy for heart, lung, and kidney failure. And so we're focused on this big problem. Uh, these are big chronic diseases, as Les Levin uh, alluded to uh, earlier. And uh, there's a growing awareness that peri, uh, pre peri, and postnatal origins of later chronic disease are even more important economically and medically uh, than the risks that we now focus on which is going to drive this, uh, this direction even further. And so the, the value, perhaps, the value proposition of the Proof Center is to pursue superior health care by bringing diagnostic and predictive uh, management tools to physicians and their teams and guidance tools uh, for the pharmaceutical industry uh, in uh, drug discovery. With that framework, I wanted to uh, ask the question, uh, why are we focused on diagnostics and predictives? And this slide, uh, lent graciously by Brad Stewart, the CEO of Silex, uh, shows you something that some people in the room know well, but uh, two to three percent of the expenditures in healthcare are in uh, the clinical laboratory, uh, but they affect uh, daily. 75% uh, of physician, uh, key physician decision making. And so for a small amount of the expenditure, there's a huge impact on care of all, uh, of all patients. And, and in the context of the NCE and the commercialization aspect, if one looks at in the post collapse of 2008 in this, uh, in this cartoon, or it's not a cartoon, in these in these uh, portfolios for diagnostics at the top, uh, pharma on the second, and then the S&P 500 on the bottom, you can see that the relative share price performance since, two th since 2006, uh, diagnostics are right at the top. And so it is a space, however difficult, however complex and challenging, it's a space of, of opportunity and need, uh, both. So in, in looking about how we, uh, in our work, can contribute towards a, a, 
whatever the definition of personalized care, uh, personalized medicine, uh, if we look at this uh, somewhat complex uh, graphic, uh, disease burden, cost, and irreversibility on the y-axis over time, and you see that uh, even Brad Popovich will follow that red line eventually, and we won't be able to help Brad in normal circumstances till we get to the blue arrow, because that's the point of current uh, typical intervention. 75% of all uh, care expenditures are at that point, and there's a great desire to move earlier to earlier clinical detection, but people believe, and we are among that group who believe that early molecular detection is possible, and having a better understanding of behavior, environment, and genetic initiating events and baseline risks could give us a, a future for medicine that's more proactive than reactive and assess risks, refine those uh, risk assessments, and then predict and diagnose uh, in a very sensitive and specific way to monitor progression uh, and predict events and inform therapeutics. And so we're focused on in our programs on not on the genotype, but on gene expression proteins and metabolites. So we, we have chosen from the very beginning, uh, since 2004, for a variety of reasons I won't go into today, to focus on the R messenger RNA, and now more recently on microRNAs, uh, proteins, peptides, and uh, uh, non-peptidic metabolites, and specifically I've focused on uh, peripheral blood, looking at uh, the Pax gene uh, messenger RNA expression profiles, uh, and also looking at the plasma proteome uh, and metabolites uh, as a, a different compartment within the circulation reflecting the release of either injury molecules, uh, reflecting injury or activation of the immune system or the inflammatory processes or even repair and chronic rejection. And, and so our focus is on omics, on a biosignature in the blood, it's not on genotyping or genetics. And so when one looks along the life cycle of our work from clinical unmet need to discovery, development, and clinical implementation, we always ask repeatedly, what is the question? And we ask what is the question with uh, expert coal-faced clinician working groups who work with and for the Proof Center and the BIT program in order to define a question that will really influence uh, patient care and potentially create socioeconomic value, both in terms of cost savings for the healthcare system, but also in terms of wealth creation. And once we have that question defined, we've, we've stayed rather tried and true with Affymetrix's microarray platform, developed uh, uh, the candidate list of genes, and from that, using a very uh, computationally driven uh, approach, Raymond Ng leading that for us in our informatics team, uh, we develop both genomic and proteomic classifier panels, biosignatures, that, are, that correspond to the phenotype of different patient groups that we're comparing. With that initial discovery and local internal validation, we go then to the uh, refinement uh, phase, which is using more computational tools, but also then uh, different levels of external cohort uh, validation in order to refine the fit for purpose. And with that, uh, using microarrays again, and in this instance the MRM mass spectrometry at the UVic Proteomics Center, we refine these panels, these sets of genes, sets of proteins, and also proteogenomic panels in order to get a biomarker risk score that we ultimately, working with bioinformatics, can put onto a handheld device for, for clinical utility uh, in the uh, conditions of need. So that's the framework that we're talking about uh, when we talk about biomarkers and transplantation. And all of the while there's, there's work going on on assay development, health economics uh, appraisal and modeling, uh, regulatory relationships, reimbursement strategies, and commercialization, and we'll talk briefly about those in the context of BIT today. So. I can, I can say, if you don't feel it already, that we have a lot of passion about improving transplant care. Dr. Keon is a transplant uh, nephrologist for, for life. Uh, organ failure is increasing uh, worldwide. Transplantation is one of the options for care. 
A prediction of immune rejection is lacking, and definitive detection of rejection is, uh, is invasive and is by catheter-based uh, techniques that are very expensive. And when rejection has occurred, damage is already done to the target organ. Some of it is ir irreparable. And omic approaches have shown some great promise. So, before I hand to my colleague, uh, Paul Keon, I'll just set, set up one scenario uh, before he uh, goes into a little bit of the data uh, that we wanted to share today. So, the unmet clinical need, uh, Maxine Vukic, uh, presents with uh, the need for a heart transplant. Uh, she, like other tra heart transplant patients, by protocol, had 14, at least 14 biopsies in the first year post-transplant, and a so-called standard immunosuppressive therapy regimen. And the first step towards uh, developing a test uh, that is low risk for the FDA and other regulatory agencies is to develop a blood test that could guide the need for the biopsy and either uh, increase the intensity of feeling that the biopsy should be done or, or actually uh, lead to not doing a biopsy, which is really the objective of, of the first stage of implementation of a test that we might uh, develop. And meanwhile, uh, continue to have standard immunosuppressive therapy. Where we're going very quickly and very, very soon is to a two-test uh, model, though. One, a blood test to replace the need for the biopsy, that is diagnostic and has performance characteristics that uh, allow it to reach that, uh, that level of uh, value and also something that we didn't believe was going to be as valuable as it's turned out to be which is to develop blood tests pre-transplant, obtained from blood pre-transplant in end-stage patients uh, to predict the occurrence of rejection, acute rejection for example in heart or kidney in the first six months post-transplant with a high, a high degree of sensitivity and specificity. And with that, then, change the peritransplant immunosuppressive induction as well as the post-transplant uh, care. And that's really the objective, and it's really, this cartoon really illustrates sort of some of the thinking that goes on behind uh, this program. And so, what we've, what we've, you heard this from Brad, we started out part of it from Brad. We were funded by the Applied Human Health uh, Genomics <coughs> Program from Genome Canada initially in 2004. It was $9.1 million. You'll so realize why I'm saying that uh, in a moment. Uh, we, we developed uh, initial panels and went through exploratory uh, data submission with the FDA. They were able to replicate our results based on our raw data and we write, wrote a paper with them on the process of developing biosignatures. Uh, and this led them to competitive funding from the TPAW program that has spanned until uh, the end of uh, 2011 in order to get, to get forward to do refinement of our gene and protein signatures for acute and chronic rejection, uh, to develop validation assays, and uh, to, uh, to enroll about 500 uh, patients in an international observational trial, as you see here, and then do pre-ID submissions. Uh, and uh, this funding was $6.5 million. And this is actually, as Brad said, the bridge to the PPM program, the personalized uh, medicine program. I guess I probably got it backwards. And uh, this is uh, provisionally or conditionally approved uh, to actually do the work proof of principle in Vancouver uh, in the two major uh, general hospitals to implement the initial biomarker tests uh, in the transplant uh, setting. And so that's, that's really where we're going in 2012-13 and Paul Keon is going to set you up with uh, some of the work we did in BIT1 and BIT2.